in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, James and John approach Jesus making a request of Him. Their desire is to sit in the kingdom of heaven, one on the right hand and one on the left hand of Jesus. Jesus reminds them, of course, that it is not possible for Him to give them their request. He says, rather, the kingdom of heaven is provided for them for whom it is prepared. He reminds them that they are going to have to taste the cup which He will taste. They will have to be baptized with the baptism of which He is baptized. And then to all the disciples, He tells them that the road to greatness is the road to service and reminds them that they have been called into this world so that they might be ministers or servants of others. And then in verse 45 of Mark chapter 10, Jesus says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. In this particular statement, Jesus reminds them of the mission for which He has come. And ultimately, this mission of His will become their mission. Just as He has been sent in the wor into the world to minister unto others, so will they likewise be sent into the world to minister unto others. We ourselves today recognize as members of the Lord's body, the church, that we have been sent into the world so that we might minister unto others. We are to lose sight of ourselves and take into consideration the needs of others. We are to be ministers even as Jesus was a minister. In this way, we, we will achieve seats in the kingdom of heaven, just as James and John would be able to do. In this passage of Scripture, verse 45 of Mark chapter 10, there are four truths stated by our Lord. I want to examine those four truths that Jesus mentions to these disciples. The first truth is the mission of Christ. He says, The Son of Man came not into the world to be ministered unto, but to minister. Jesus tells His disciples that He, as the Son of Man, has come into the world. Our faith is established upon the truth that Jesus has come into the world. Our security, our assurance, and our confidence in the kingdom of heaven is the truth that Jesus has come into the world. In the 18th chapter of the Gospel of John, at verse 40, 37, Jesus says to the governor Pilate as he stands before him to be judged, He said, To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I might minister and witness unto the truth. Jesus tells this Roman governor that he has come into the world. He has been born so that he might bear witness unto the truth. Jesus came into the world so that he might reveal unto us the truth of God. This truth today is stated in his book, The Bible. When we open the pages of the Bible, we can read the words of Jesus, and thereby we can come to know the truth of God. In Luke, the second chapter and the 49th verse, Jesus said to his mother Mary, Know ye not that I must be about my father's business? As Jesus had come into the world, he came so that he might be about the father's business. Almighty God had a purpose for the birth, for the coming of Jesus Christ into the world. 
Jesus came so that He might do the bidding of the Father, that He might do the will of God. And even at this young age of twelve, Jesus understood that He must be about His Father's business. If you and I are going to be pleasing unto God this day, we must be about our Father's business. We must know the truth that has been revealed unto us by the Lord Jesus Christ and by those who came after Him who were inspired by the Holy Spirit so that we must be about our Father's business. Just as God had a purpose for the life of Christ, so He has a purpose for us. And that purpose is to do His will. In the 19th chapter of the Gospel of Luke at verse 10, Jesus stated to Zacchaeus, For I am come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus had come into the world so that He might seek and save the lost. Humanity is lost because of sin. Humanity is separated from God because of sin. Jesus came so that He might bridge that great gulf that existed between the heart of man and the heart of God. Jesus came so that He might seek and to save that which is lost. The lost can only be saved through Jesus Christ. We must come to faith in Christ. We must obey the will of Christ so that we might be saved from our sins. In Matthew 9 and verse 13, Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners unto repentance. Jesus came into the world so that He might minister to those who were in need of salvation. Jesus came so that He might minister unto those who were in sin. The righteous do not need a physician, but sinners do, as Jesus explained to Matthew. And so Jesus came so that He might minister unto those who are diseased with sin. Through Jesus Christ we can be healed of our sin, of our transgression. In John 10 and verse 10, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Abundantly. As our sins are forgiven, we enter into that abundant life. As our transgressions are cleansed by the blood of Christ, we come to know that abundant life. The abundant life in Christ is characterized by peace, by contentment, with confidence. And so Jesus came so that we might have that life. In the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John, and the 28th verse, Jesus said, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again I leave the world and go to the Father. Jesus came into the world from the Father so that He might minister unto lost humanity, so that He might reveal unto us the truth of Almighty God so that He might call those who were in sin unto Him, so that we might have, through our forgiveness of sin, the abundant life. Our faith rests upon this divine truth that Jesus came into the world. But the second truth is that Jesus willingly gave His life. The Son of Man has come not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life. Jesus came to die. He was born of the Virgin Mary, knowing that He would die. When He stood in the temple at the age of twelve, He knew that He would die. And when He makes this statement to His disciples in the 16th chapter of John and the 28th verse, I leave the world and go to my Father, He knew that He would die. And He did that willingly. He offered Himself, His life, His human existence upon the earth, willingly, freely, in John chapter 10 at verses 17 and 18, 
Jesus speaks to His disciples and says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Notice Jesus' willing, willingness to do the commandment of the Father. Jesus said, I have the power to take my life, to give my life. The life of Christ was not taken by the multitude whose hearts were filled with hate, who cried out in Pilate's court that he be crucified, but rather the life of Christ was given because Christ so willed that it might be given. He said, I have the power over my life. This was the commandment of the Father. No man takes it from me, but I give it. Jesus willingly gave Himself for us. He willingly died the cruel death of Golgotha for us. Jesus willingly gave Himself according to the commandment of the Father. In Isaiah the 53rd chapter, which sometimes we refer to as the chapter of the suffering Messiah, here in this particular chapter spoken by Isaiah some 700 years before the coming of Christ, Jesus is shown to be the suffering Savior. In verse 4 and 5, the Scripture says, Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions, He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. In these verses of Scripture, in this particular chapter, we see the offering of the life of Jesus Christ. We see that He was willing to bear our griefs and our sorrows. For us, He was stricken, afflicted of God, and smitten. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. Christ accomplished nothing for Himself in willingly dying, but rather His will to die was for us, for lost humanity. Jesus willingly gave Himself so that humanity might live, so that humanity might know God, so that humanity might be reconciled unto the Father and be at peace with the Almighty Creator. Jesus willingly offered Himself for us. What a sacrifice! What a commitment that Jesus was willing to make. In Matthew the 26th chapter, at verses 53 and 54, this multitude comes to take Jesus. They desire to kill Him. They do not like His teaching. They do not appreciate His life. All that He had done for them were acts of kindness, and they did not have any desire to give Him any thanks, any honor, but rather they come to take Him. Jesus has been in the garden praying unto His heavenly Father. He has asked the Father, If it is possible, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Because Jesus always was willing to do the commandment, the will of the Father. And this multitude comes to take Him. At verses 53 and 54, Jesus says to them, Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my Father, 
and He will presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. But then how shall the Scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? If we go back into the Old Testament Scriptures, we read of the Christ that would be offered. We have read two verses of Scripture from the chapter in Isaiah 53. We have read of that prophet foretelling the death, the offering of Jesus Christ. There are many other passages throughout the Old Testament that predict, prophesy that Jesus is going to die. When this multitude comes to take Jesus, He says, Do you not understand that I can now call for twelve legions of angels and they will deliver me? The angels had come to strengthen Christ following His temptation in Matthew chapter 4. And now Jesus declares to this mob of hate-filled people that I can call twelve legions of angels and be delivered. I have the power over my life. You have none. They thought that they were putting Christ to death. They believed that the consent of Pilate was their will and their consent. But this was God's work. This was the plan of the Almighty. God has planned for Jesus to die. And Jesus willingly submits to that death upon the cross. In the book of Philippians, at chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, the Apostle Paul writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and says, "...who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men." Jesus was equal with God. In John 10 and verse 30, Jesus had said, I and my Father are one. And that statement enraged the multitude that heard it. Jesus was on an equality with God. Jesus was God in the flesh. But Christ willingly left that eternal realm. Jesus willingly took upon Himself flesh and blood being found in the form of a man, not just any man, not just any type of individual, but rather that of a servant. Because Jesus said the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom. The third truth is that His death freed the slave. Jesus became the ransom. The word ransom as it is used in this text means an offering, a payment made to free someone. Jesus came so that He might set the slave free. To what were we enslaved? Sin. In John the 8th chapter, <clears throat> Jesus, in speaking to the multitude, said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they said, Why, we've never been in bondage to any man. Ha ha! What a joke! They had been in bondage in Egypt. That deliverance by Moses was one of the greatest miracles that God had ever performed in the Old Testament. They had been in bondage to the Assyrians. They had spent 70 years in bondage to the Babylonians. Their lives of disobedience had brought them into bondage. Jesus said, "Ye shall be made free if you know the truth. We've never been in bondage to any man. And yet their heritage was a heritage of bondage. But Jesus was not interested in setting them free from physical bondage even now. They wore the Roman boot around their net, neck. Rome had invaded the land of Palestine. They were submissive to Roman authority and the Roman will. But Jesus did not come to set them free from that physical bondage, but rather He came to set them free from the bondage of sin.
If the Son shall make you free, verse 36, John 8, ye shall be free indeed. In Hebrews 7 and verse 25, <clears throat> He is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God through Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. Jesus was able to set them free completely, utterly. He was able to break the chains of slavery that bound them to the prince of this world. That liar of all liars, John 8 and verse 44. The one who was the father of lies, the devil, Satan, the old deceiver, the one whom John calls in the book of Revelation, the old serpent. Did he not enter into the garden in the form of a serpent in Genesis chapter 3? Did he not deceive and captivate the hearts of Adam and Eve so that their disobedience unto God in partaking of that fruit of which they were told not to eat caused them to be cast out of that garden, removed from that paradise? Sin removes us from the paradise of God. Sin places us in bondage to Satan to slavery. Sin is a chain that binds us to Satan. And Jesus came so that He might free the slave. I came to offer a ransom, make a payment, so that those who were enslaved by sin could be set free. In Ephesians 1 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul writes, In whom, Jesus Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of His grace. Through the blood of Christ we are redeemed from sin. We are set free from this awful taskmaster. The chains of this bondage are broken by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are redeemed through Christ, set free from the bondage of sin, made free men, but yet, as Paul states in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we become the servants of God. When Paul writes Romans chapter 6, he writes those who are servants unto death, servants unto unrighteousness, are servants to life and servants to righteousness. We're going to serve in this life, but we choose the master that we will serve. We will either serve the old devil, Satan, or we will serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus came so that He might make a payment that we might be set free from the bondage of sin. 1 Corinthians 7, 23, Paul said, Ye are bought with a price. Therefore be not ye the servants of men. In Galatians 5 and verse 1, Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again in a yoke of bondage. The yoke of bondage that Paul mentions in that passage of Scripture is that Old Testament law. He's speaking to Jews who have had that yoke removed from them, and they are now free under this covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ, which the writer of the Hebrew letter explains is a better covenant, a more perfect covenant, established upon better and greater promises. And those promises are that we become the servants of God, we become the sons of God, the children of God, heir to all of the blessings that heaven has to offer. This is the ransom that the Lord Jesus Christ paid. And then the fourth truth is, the death was for many. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. The word many in this passage of Scripture means the whole of humanity. Every son and daughter that would be born from Adam's race, every child that would live, upon this mundane sphere, planet earth. Jesus came to set all people free from the bondage of sin. He came to minister unto all people. There are no distinctive races in the kingdom of God. 
while men may set boundaries upon those who are allowed into certain positions of prestige, there are none in the kingdom of God. All are equal. All have the same rights under the banner of the cross. In the fifth chapter of Romans and the fifteenth verse, the writer says, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. The offense refers to the transgression of Adam. The free gift refers to that grace that has been provided through the Lord Jesus Christ. For if through the offense of one many be dead, from Adam came the severe penalty of sin, death. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6 and verse 23. Much more in far greater abundance the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. The whole of humanity was covered by the sacred blood of Jesus Christ so that all from every race, from every culture, from every language who were in bondage to sin could be redeemed and set free by the blood of Jesus the Christ. In Isaiah the 53rd chapter, at verse 6, the Old Testament prophet said, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressions. Jesus Christ has died for the many so that we might be redeemed. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He by the grace of God should taste death for every man. And as Hebrews 11 and verse 12 says in fulfillment of that ancient promise made to Abraham, that redemption shall be even as the stars in multitude and the sand by the sea which is innumerable. Jesus Christ states to James and John unto His disciples His divine mission of coming into the world. He came from heaven, willingly gave His life, offering Himself as a ransom so that the blessing could come unto many. We thank God for this unspeakable gift that has come to us. And through our obedience to the gospel of Christ, faith, repentance, confession, and immersion in water, we can know the redemption and the blessings of the life of Jesus Christ. We offer the invitation of Jesus as we stand and sing this hymn.